Bienvenue à cette... A very warm welcome to this press conference on the subject of the joint RCRC United Nations joint statement on sexual and gender-based violence in times of conflict. As you know, today we have Mr. Antonio Guterres, Secretary General of the United Nations, Madame Julienne Lesage, Director of the Women's Movement for Peace and Development and President of that movement, and Mr. Peter Mara, who is chair of the ICRC. We've asked our speakers to make a small introduction, and then we will open the floor for a few questions. Before we begin, I would ask you to turn off your mobile telephones or to silence them, please. And this press conference has interpretation in French and English for your convenience. So without further ado, I'd like to give the floor to Mr. Antonio Guterres, the Secretary General of the United Nations. Gentlemen, it's good to be back in this room after, uh, I believe, two years. <laughs> Thank you very much for being here as President Peter Maurer and I, together with uh, Madame Julienne Lusange, launch an urgent joint appeal for global action to prevent and end sexual and gender-based violence in and around conflict. These crimes are just some of the tragic violations of international humanitarian law that we see around the world. As we mark the 70th anniversary of the 1949 Geneva Conventions, I congratulate President Peter Maurer and the International Committee of the Red Cross for their guardianship of the Conventions, a powerful assertion of human dignity and for their work to save lives around the world. Throughout my years at UNHCR, I was frequently horrified by first-hand accounts of sexual and gender-based violence in war zones from the Democratic Republic of the Congo to the former Yugoslavia. Last year in Bangladesh, Rohingya refugees told me of the gang rape of women and girls in their homes before they fled Myanmar. And earlier this month, we heard of brutal sexual violence, including the rape of at least 130 women and girls in South Sudan between September and December last year. We should also remember that all forms of violence against women, including domestic abuse, increase in situations of armed conflict and displacement. Let me be clear. Sexual and gender-based violence in conflict is not only a horrendous and life-changing crime, most often perpetrated against women and girls. It is also used as a tactic of war to terrorize families, dehumanize communities, and destabilize societies so that they struggle to, regard, to recover for years or even decades after the guns fall silent. That is why sexual and gender-based violence in conflict is now widely recognized as a war crime that is preventable and punishable. The United Nations Security Council has played an important role in the past decades by passing successive resolutions that emphasize accountability for perpetrators and services for survivors. I salute those who have been working to bring these crimes to the world's attention, including Nobel laureates Nadia Murad and Dennis Mukwege. I also commend the, activi the activists and civil society organizations that have played such an important role in supporting survivors, and I thank Julien Lusange for representing them here today. But while there have been significant steps towards accountability, most sexual and gender-based violence in and around conflict is never reported, investigated, or prosecuted. And while supporting the women and girls who survive such violence costs relatively little, many victims and survivors are isolated and stigmatized, rejected by their families and communities, and without the support they need to deal with unimaginable physical and emotional trauma. Ladies and gentlemen, governments have the central responsibility for tackling this global crisis. And we are also grappling with how to address the non-state actors that perpetrate such crimes. But it doesn't stop there. All of us must do everything in our power to prevent and end sexual and gender-based violence in and around conflict and to support victims and survivors. At the United Nations, I have taken serious steps in the past two years to make zero tolerance of sexual exploitation and abuse by United Nations staff 
and peacekeepers into a reality. We will not tolerate anyone who attempts to cover up these crimes with the UN flag. Today, I am proud that the United Nations and the International Red Cross and Red Crescent Movement are united in our commitment to do more and to demand more of others to prevent and end these crimes. We will replace impunity with justice and indifference with action. Survivors, their experiences, needs and demands will be at the heart of everything we do. And the United Nations will scale up its efforts in several ways. First, we are introducing all our peace operations around the world to make sure that they have policies and systems in place to prevent conflict-related sexual and gender-based violence and to pursue justice for victims and survivors. Second, our peace operations and where relevant other field presences will include gender and protection advisors who will be able to respond to this crisis and conduct outreach with local communities and organizations. And third, we are stepping up efforts to mobilize resources for grassroots organizations, particularly women's organizations, that are on the front lines of prevention and response. And finally, we are directing staff across the UN system to promote women's meaningful participation in conflict prevention and resolution and in all formal peace processes. The world is growing ever more aware of the ubiquity of conflict-related sexual and gender-based violence. We must do everything in our power to end the horror and stigma that affects hundreds of thousands of women and girls, as well as men and boys, worldwide. Thank you. Merci beaucoup, Monsieur le Secrétaire. Thank you very much, Secretary General. I'd now like to give the floor to Madame Julien Assange. Thank you very much. Secretary General of the United Nations, President of the ICRC, ladies and gentlemen, we're very grateful to you for having invited us to represent the voice of victims and survivors of sexual violence, those who are also agents of change. I'm from the Democratic Republic of Congo, specifically from the town of Beni, which is a region in the grip of genocide, even as I speak. Our organization, the Women's Movement for Peace and Comprehensive Development, Sofipadi, provides comprehensive management and support for survivors, medical, psychological, legal, and legal. And in that context, and for more than 20 years of instability and insecurity, we have been organizing socioeconomic rehabilitation for victims. On the basis of a community approach, we involve the communities as a whole, traditional leaders, young people, and survivors themselves in our combat. Women come to us as victims, but they go home as agents of change once they have been instructed on their rights and on the laws which punish sexual violence. They join the fight at our side. During mobile assemblies organized in villages, populations take part in meetings and they understand that justice can be delivered and perpetrators can be punished. Their work in the medical centers is recognized by all stakeholders, but we do not receive the necessary funding to sufficiently support our work. Mr. Secretary General, we recognize your commitment to the combat against gender-based and sex, gender -based and sexist violence. Despite all our efforts, however, violence continue across the world. And during this month of February, our medical center, Karibuni Wamama in Bunia, received in one week 28 children who were victims of serious sexual offences, including a baby of two years. We continue to see women who have been captives held by various different armed groups in our regional offices. They suffer not only slavery, but also forced marriages, forced labour, physical and psychological violence, economic violence and inhuman and degrading treatment. Domestic violence, bullying in school and harassment in the workplace are all abuse that is unacceptable. It is high time that we stop turning women's bodies into battlefields, that victims obtain justice and reparation, and that we put an end to sexual violence as a combat tactic. And in order to ensure that this becomes a reality, it is high time that women are involved in peace building and in all decisions surrounding it. It is high time that we make good on the commitment of the 
World Humanitarian Summit of 2016 in Istanbul, ensuring that the necessary funding is given to organisations fighting against gender-based violence. We must set up prevention mechanisms instead of simply responding. We must shelter women, we must facilitate access to core services, provide sufficient health services, drinking water, roads, infrastructure, renewable energy and solar energy in order to avoid women having to go out into the remote uh, countryside and uh, remote areas where they are at risk of kidnap and harassment. In order to deal with this emergency, we need well-funded, technically grounded structures at the local level. To allow us to really be able to do this, we must be able to provide training and support and provide the means to ensure that women's organisations and groups can provide the necessary and different trainings they receive to others, that they can grow and establish themselves and that they can ensure the sustainability of their activities. We must raise awareness among community members as well as young people, fostering their break away from armed groups. The budget for programmes around rehabilitation for victims must be genuinely overhauled during the allocation of the various funds to combat sexual violence. And this will allow us to properly design programmes to change the life of victims. Children who are born of rape and victims of sexual violence must be involved in all programmes. There must be legal registration organised by nation states of all children as fully recognised citizens in these contexts. Our recommendations are to prevent violence by establishing core services, water, energy, medical care and skills training. To properly, technically and financially support training for women's groups in order to make them able to respond immediately in a timely fashion to the needs of women and girls in conflict, in theatres of conflict. These are our first line humanitarian actors. Provide core services to survivors and set up a framework to foster dialogue between men and women in order to foster in turn discussion around violence problems locally. We must be able to use a community-based approach in order to set up medical, fully equipped centres, particularly psychological centres and legal services in order to provide holistic care for victims. We must strengthen and support our survivors' networks, both nationally and internationally, to ensure their voice is heard. We must clean up the area in order to effectively bring an end to conflicts. We must set up a reparation fund from the member states of the United Nations and legal institutions must be properly operational and managed by people who have the necessary training with rehabilitated prisons and a real rehabilitation and education program for victims and activists. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much, Madame Lassange. And now it's my pleasure to pass the floor to Mr. Peter Mara, President of the International Committee of the Red Cross. You have the floor, sir. Secretary General, Madame uh, Lussange, uh, ladies and gentlemen, the world is facing a grave protection failure. The failure to address the enormous harm caused by sexual and gender-based violence. The International Red Cross and Red Crescent Movement and the United Nations, while working side by side in many places uh, of the world, very rarely speak out together. But as you have heard today, the Secretary General and I have felt compelled with Julien to make a public stand against sexual and gender-based violence and together call for urgent action. Today we pledge to do better for the survivors. We demand an end to sexual atrocities used as tactic of war, Julien just mentioned it. We demand a change in attitudes that blame survivors, not the perpetrators. We demand greater protections for communities at risk. Above all, we demand that survivors are listened to, taken seriously, and their needs are put first. In this year, the 70th anniversary of the Geneva Conventions that uh, Antonio kindly mentioned, we are asking states to restate their commitment to international humanitarian law. The law is clear. Rape and other forms of sexual violence are violations. The Geneva Conventions made this prohibition clear and universal 
And yet, 70 years on, we continue to face failures of behavior and accountability. The staff and volunteers of the Red Cross and Red Crescent movement around the world know only too well the devastating impacts that sexual and gender-based violence have on women and men, girls and boys. We work with the survivors of horrific acts, including with women and girls given as rewards in war, fathers whose sons have been abducted and raped, young women fleeing disaster and conflict only to be sexually enslaved, and with detainees when sexual atrocities are wielded as means of torture. We see the enormous and lasting harm that sexual and gender-based violence causes, both physical and psychological. Too often it is committed with the intent to dehumanize and degrade. We also know there are violations that we do not see or hear. Sexual violence is a crime obscured by taboo. Because of victim blaming and stigma, too many walk with a secret shame. It goes unreported, covered up, and too often the perpetrators go free. These violations are horrific. They should shock us. But instead of turning away in horror or discomfort, we must act. Survivors, communities at risk, and advocates are telling us that more needs to be done. In communities affected by violence, young women report their greatest fear is sexual violence. They are asking us for us to step up our efforts. We are listening and we must respond with all urgency. Communities are asking for safety and security, access to health services, and for survivors to be treated with respect and dignity. Today, we pledge to do more. We will engage more strongly with communities and we will be guided by the needs and wishes of survivors. Too often, there is a lack of investment in survivors' rights, resilience, and capacities. We will continue to support survivors and their local organizations. I recognize the brave Red Cross and Red Crescent workers, the UN workers, local NGOs, and advocates like Julienne, who continue helping their brothers and sisters despite receiving threats in carrying out the work that is challenging power balances and harmful social prejudices. I say to you, your work is valued, it is critical, keep striving to make the difference and we will continue to support you. In response to community needs, we are increasing mental health and psychosocial support services, as well as economic support. We are working with survivors who come to our doors and we reach out into communities to find those suffering in silence. Through the humanitarian principles of neutrality and impartiality, we will work with children and adults regardless of gender, however defined. Today, the International Committee of the Red Cross is launching an appeal of 10, 27 million to help us better respond to sexual violence in 14 key countries, including expanded services in Colombia, improved responses in Syria, and new services in Central African Republic. For the first time, we will place dedicated specialists in six countries this year to increase the field coordination and response of the ICRC. We are concerned with prevention as well as response. Sexual violence is not an inevitable part of war, and not all armed actors rape. This means violations can be prevented. We are, taking, we are talking with arms bearers and authorities to understand these practices of restraint to better influence and prevent violations before they occur. We are working to protect communities in the path of harm. The risk of abuses is higher in the wake of disasters for vulnerable migrants and those living in poverty. The International Federation will ramp up its support of national societies to strengthen local services that put survivals at the center, including in health and building livelihoods. Collectively, we have a responsibility to do better. Current efforts are clearly failing short. The ICRC with the International Red Cross and Red Crescent Movement and the UN today pledge to do better for survivors and communities at risk 
sexual and gender-based violence is simply not something we can accept. We cannot fail those who need us most. Thank you. Thank you very much, President Maurer. I now can take a few questions. Um, I have seen quite a few already. I'll start with Lisa. Can you introduce yourself? Please try to ask questions on what we have just heard um, and also to whom you would like to ask your question. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Lisa Schlein, Voice of America. Uh, I've got a couple of questions. I, uh, may I ask you a question in English, Ms. Uh, Lusange? One question to the employees, so we can give the floor to One question per person, or? <laughs> <laughs> okay. Uh, it, well, from you, with the work, uh, if you, uh, if anyone has a number, perhaps of the uh, how many women and young girls, boys too, are raped in the Democratic Republic of Congo. But what what I want to specifically ask is, I was one of the things that shocked me most in the uh, report on South Sudan was how normal rape had become and that women just assumed that they were going to be raped and they picked up the situation, went on with their lives and were continued to be raped. Does a similar situation occur in uh, the DRC and how, how do you ever uh, manage to treat these women so that they can overcome this situation. And, and just to the Secretary General, quickly. Lisa, I'm sorry. I have to working? give everybody okay. the possibility to ask. Mrs. Rosange. Thank you very much for asking that question. It's not that women are expecting to be raped. It's the a fact that the risk is very real indeed. Any woman in a conflict situation is a potential victim, so it can happen at any moment when uh, they move, when they go and look for firewood, when they look for water to drink, or even when they're at home. People enter their homes to rape them. It's not as if they expect it as such. Now, to answer the question of what we do to help the victims, well, we send messages over the radio system and once the women are identified, they are immediately referred to our offices, to our care centers. Then uh, there's medical care that's provided. They are listened to by a psychologist. If they want to um, file a suit or bring the matter up uh, before a court, then we provide uh, legal advice to do that. And there is psychological support provided to the woman and the family, because it's not just the woman themselves who are traumatized. It's the whole family. So it's not just a one-off uh, consultation or treatment. It's a very long procedure. Now, when it comes to statistics, we do have data. But I don't want to give any data during my presentation, because even one single person, it's very serious. I can tell you that since January, we've cared for 70 victims. And the majority are women and girls between the ages of 14 and two or three. This is really the target group. And then young women from 24 uh, to 45 years of age, uh, they're also very frequently victims. So I didn't give you any statistics today. You can find them on our websites or our reports, um, or we can send them to you in writing. But it's extremely prevalent. Wherever there is a conflict, there will be this kind of violence. And in fact, it becomes entrenched in communities, even in cities where there was no conflict. There are cities where we see sexual violence now because there's impunity and there's bad governance. So we're not just going to look at care for victims. We're going to try and work on the system as a whole. Merci. Catherine Fiocom from Bukonga for France 24. Secretary General, you spoke about sexual violence used as a weapon of war during conflict. But I want to come back to the question of men and boys. 
there's very little that is said about them. We tend to focus on women when talking about sexual violence. So I wonder whether in the program that you're going to be establishing and that the ICRC will uh, help implement, I wonder whether there's any specific work going to be done to address sexual violence against men and boys. We don't say very much about it, but we know that there are figures testifying to this practice in conflict going way back. Well, there's work in two areas to be done relating to men and boys. There's prevention along the same lines as everything that's done for women and girls, giving them tools to protect themselves better. But there's also awareness raising and educational work to be done with men and boys, particularly in those areas where conflict is rife. And this to avoid young men in fact, uh, becoming perpetrators themselves from this point of view. There are a lot of projects underway throughout the world on education and awareness raising amongst uh, young men and men in general to make sure that they become aware of the seriousness of these acts and so that they can be advocates uh, to combat sexual violence in all of the areas where they are. And then there are men and boys as victims of sexual violence. And of course, the, it is possible to support them. But I have to speak very frankly in saying that in general, when it comes to expertise, uh, the United Nations and the other stakeholders that we work with to properly address the situation and uh, heal the trauma, we are lagging behind, I confess. We have less capacity to address these issues, uh, which are not as prevalent as sexual violence against women and girls, but are nonetheless equally serious. Uh, but we do have a lesser capacity to respond. Our response is less developed. And uh, perhaps there's even greater community stigma attached to this. On my side as well, uh, you may have uh noticed that in my statement I spoke about women and men, boys and girls, and uh, it is very much our opinion that, uh, unfortunately, uh, violence against men and women, boys and girls is indiscriminate uh, with regard to gender. It happens to boys and girls, men and women. Uh, it reunites with the question on statistics. I think one of the big problem we are encountering is that it is an obscured crime, and that statistics are difficult to establish. That's the reason why at the ICRC, two years ago, we changed our methodological approach, and we said our, the burden of, uh, we have a reversed burden of proof, which is basically our hypothesis is that sexual and gender-based violence against women and men is happening. And from this basis on, we start to try to build program and responses. For instance, in detention, we know that uh, men are almost equally, if not more frequently, the victims of sexual and uh, gender-based uh, violence. There are situations which are prone to differences between the genders, but in our approach, we definitely recognize that men and women are able to be victims and perpetrators, and we need to reverse the burden of proof in order to have a fuller picture on the large amount of, victim, uh, of victims that we are encountering in particular uh, in conflict. But you, you are right that in the policy discourse, and Antonio has referred to it as well, in the policy discourse of international conferences and meetings, it is always an implicit suggestion that only women are victims, while the reality is that men and women, boys and girls, are. Uh, Julian, would I add something?
I think Julien wants to add something. I wanted to say that, yes, it is indeed true that sexual violence does um, affect men and boys, and we treat the victims exactly in the same way as any other victims. So certainly we do care for men and boys. There are statistics, although it's often underreported. We do disaggregate the data um, by gender and by age. You will find this in our figures. Tom. I'll now give the floor to a man, Tom. Thank you very much. Uh, Tom Miles from Reuters, Reuters News Agency. Um, Secretary General, anybody else who wants to answer? Do you think that the International Criminal Court is essentially a feminist institution? Would it help if we regarded it as such? I don't think the International Criminal Court is a feminist institution. I think the International Criminal Court is a fundamental pillar uh, in order to make sure that a number of hideous crimes uh, can be punished, uh, independently of the gender involved. And um, uh, I think it is very important uh, in the moment in which so many multilateral institutions are under fire, it's very important to support the International Criminal Court and to recognize that uh, uh, international penal justice is an absolutely essential element mm -hmm. in our protection, global protection strategy. I would just like to make one comment on the word feminist um, that you made and about the, the last question that we have. Let's be clear. We live in a male-dominated world and with a male-dominated culture. And it's not by chance that many of the crimes perpetrated against uh, uh, women and girls uh, are so often neglected by uh, government institutions and even by international organizations. I mean, um, uh, we all uh, have seen in uh, some politicians uh, when they speak about rape or even uh, with other uh, uh, people with uh, relatively high status in societies, when they speak about rape, how they do it in a way that almost is a punishment to the women themselves. So uh, I think it's necessary to say that um, if we want to address the problems of violence, sexual violence against women and girls, and indirectly with also a positive impact on sexual violence against men and boys, it's absolutely essential to look into the questions of power in our societies. And maybe you call it feminism. I consider that the most important reform I'm making in the United Nations is to make sure that we have gender parity at all levels of the organization. We have it already at the top, but we want to have it at all levels of the organization because it's based on the redistribution of power that I'm sure that people will give enough priority and enough commitment in relation to the violence, namely the violence uh, uh, against women and girls. And uh, as you know, there is a Security Council resolution, Women, Peace and Security. Every year there is a, f a debate on women, peace and security that is always the most successful debate with more participants. But the situation on the ground has not improved. And it has not improved because I believe we need to address the power questions more seriously than we have done until now. I'm told I can take a last question. Uh, Gabriela. Thank you, <clears throat> Gabriela Sotomayor, Mexican journalist. Uh, on accountability, if you can speak about that, because uh, if you have any percentage or something like for any uh, 1,000 victims or 100 victims, how, what percentage of, of perpetrators are in jail or trial? I believe the ICRC knows better. I'll tell, I'll tell you very much closer to 0% than to 10% or 15%. Uh, the level of accountability in relation to these crimes in conflict situations is extremely low. President Maurer. Nothing to add to what Antonio says, but uh, maybe just to add one comment. I think uh, it is of critical importance that the numbers are rising on accountability, but it is also our key priority and effort to change behavior, and not only to focus on accountability. 
And this is the difficulty in, to which I alluded in my statement as well. We have a difficulty of engaging with perpetrators in order to change their behavior, which is not necessarily passing by the jails, but it is also passing by training, by informal codes of conduct in armed forces, by informal ways of how behavior comes into societies. Uh, Antonio has mentioned it. Uh, it's a power uh, issue, but I want it just aside of the issue of accountability, which is of crucial importance, highlight our key effort, which is with regard to engagement and changing behavior, and not necessarily only about accountability and judicial accountability procedures. Any more de la fin, revient, Madame Luzange. Oui. On the question of justice, let me give you the example of the work that we did last year. 648 persons that we provided care for throughout the whole of 2018. There were 240 suits filed in Beni and Abuya. Out of these 240 suits, we uh, got 160 eight rulings and 14 cases we lost because there was not sufficient evidence provided and the rest are still being investigated prior to trial. So at the national level, there are great efforts being made and we do deliver justice for women. But the prison structure is crumbling and the number of detainees really exceeds um, the facilities. So there are 350 persons held in uh, facilities destined for 120. And so unfortunately, people are released. They return to the communities, continue to threaten the survivors. And even we as defenders are threatened. There is training provided for police officers, for magistrates, for judges to ensure that they can do their job properly. But uh, what's still lacking is ensuring that they have the means to do their job properly. Uh, we also have to ensure that there's no political interference in rape cases. Thank you very much. I think this brings our press conference to a close. Let me say that you should have received the joint uh, press release by email, the joint UN and ICRC press release, and uh, have a very good afternoon. <laughs>